All right. Well, officially welcome everyone to We the People Competition Boot Camp Session Three. And we are really excited to see all of you today. And this is our culminating session after um, having met twice previously. And uh, we talked a lot about prep since our previous meetings were for the most part right as y'all were getting back to the school year. And now that we're a few weeks in, uh, you might have some different questions. Um, and as we get into things today, we're going to be a little bit more granular about preparing for this year's specific set of questions. All righty. So um, once again, our amazing facilitators are Ashley Vasek and Megan boyman hennies and my name is Emily Voss. Um, I am the Senior Manager of National Programs and Professional Development for the Center for Civic Ed. And uh, Megan and Ashley, do you want to briefly introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. I'm Megan. I am in my 16th year of teaching with the people, and I'm from um, northern Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Vasek. I'm in my 14th year teaching We the People, and I live in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, And um, but I teach in rural Western Maryland um, in Boonesboro, which is adjacent to Antietam Battlefield, and I don't know why I sound like I've been smoking cigars all day. Um, hopefully that will go away quickly. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. Well, you have, well, make sure you have time to get some tea. All right, so um, we'll briefly recap session two. So in session two, uh, we talked a lot about team, um, how you construct a team out of your class. And we talked about some study strategies uh, that you can use early in your school year to set your students up for success. Um, we talked about ways that you can enhance the learning experience. Um, we talked about ways that you can bring experts into your classroom environment, whether virtual or in person, to help your students think through some of the questions, build their own contextual background. Um, so we talked a bit about that. And then we talked about the importance of practice, 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 uh, and then also opportunities for feedback. Uh, so in particular, we talked about um, having students act as each other's judges and providing feedback that way, uh, and also doing uh, some recording so the students can see what they look and sound like uh, during the course of the hearing. Um, so the second and first sessions are both available on the Center for Civic Ed's YouTube page, um, and we'll someday also be posting them to our website, but they're not up there right now. Um, so our YouTube page does have them, and that's also where we'll post this session uh, when we're done. So what we'll cover today. Um, so first thing this morning, we're going to talk about the new scoring rubric. We did not really get into the scoring system at all in the previous session. Um, so we're going to take some time to break that down. And we're also then going to look closely at this year's competition questions, which came out after our last session. Um, then we'll talk about using resources and tools and building your own library of resources and books uh, that you can you know, basically compound over time and really have a, a fabulous opportunity to provide your students with excellent primary and secondary sources. Um, and then we'll also talk about tips and tricks for hosting in-school competitions. Um, since in the first session, one of the things that we talked about was that you can choose your own level of adventure with the We the People simulated congressional hearing. Um, you are not in any way, shape, or form expected or required to participate in a competition. Um, you can do the simulated congressional hearing just at your own school. So we're going to talk about how you might want to go about setting that up and then share some other resources with you for that. All right, so our agenda today, we have kind of a three-part day. Um, first thing, we'll go through the rubric and the resources and tools. Then we will have some asynchronous time. So those of us on the East Coast uh, will have a little bit of a lunch break um, and we'll explain your, your assignment, if you like, for that asynchronous time. Um, and then we'll come back to synchronous for 
uh, planning for in-school events, and then we'll talk about a uh, follow-up for what we do after the session has completed. All right, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we are more than happy to have your questions as we go. Um, if you want to use the chat, that's great. If it's easier for you to use the raise hand feature, please go ahead and do that too. Um, between me, Ashley, and Megan, um, we'll be able to see that you have a question and we'll be able to address it. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in to sec section one, the new rubric and this year's competition questions. Okay, so um, the new rubric, which I mean, Ashley and Megan, if you all have um, easy access, if you could drop the link in the chat, that would be great, um, where folks can find it on the Civic Ed page. Um, so in the rubric, uh, we have students being ultimately scored in five categories. Um, the students will be scored with the opening statement as its own category. Then the following categories are based on the follow-up discussion period. So we'll uh, be addressing evidence, their analysis and understanding, the application, and the student's level or substance of discussion. Each category is scored out of a total of 10 points. And so the total score would be out of a possible 50 points. Um, so we will break down the categories one by one. All right, so the opening statement being its own category. Um, for those of you who were previously familiar with the old scoring rubric model, this is one of the biggest changes to the new one. And one of the reasons for this is because this is the, the one and only way that students can be heavily influenced by outside factors. So obviously we really hope that the students are doing their own original work, but in the era of chat GPT and AI, um, there's every possibility that the students are receiving help in other ways. Um, so we do want to reward the students for doing good research and doing good writing, um, but this is kept out on purpose. And so the elements of the opening statement, what we're looking for would be, did the student's opening statement address all elements of the competition question. So as you all probably know, the questions that the students answer are multi-part questions. There's typically one large bold question and two or three follow-up bullet questions. So we're looking to make sure the students have answered everything. Um, we are looking to make sure that all of the student panelists have participated in presenting the opening statement. And we are looking for whether the students have taken a well-organized and logical approach to the statement, where they have used appropriate and accurate resources, whether they have referenced the constitution, if that is applicable, um, have they referenced appropriate secondary sources, legal opinions, historical documents, and other materials. So, um, I just want to make sure that we are all clear that, especially in that third element, the students are not expected to reference all of those things. It, it depends very heavily on the question the students are answering. So for example, if the students are in uh, particularly units one or unit six, there is not always a clear and obvious connection to the constitution, the document because unit one covers so much of the history and philosophy leading up to the constitution. And unit six is the constitution in the 21st century, including in a global context. Sometimes it doesn't always apply. So we're really just looking for the accuracy of appropriate references. All right. So we do have a hearing to watch, which we might, I might come back to this slide later after I go through the other elements. So we'll skip that for right now. All right, um, so category two, now this is the follow-up period. So the, the opening statement has concluded, we've gotten through our first 
four minutes, and now we're moving into the follow-up period. So as, um, as those of you familiar with the competition structure will already be aware, the students are typically asked to put aside their notes during this point, and this is just conversation with the judges. Um, so first category is evidence. And the short version is in that little yellow box there. What does the document or the source or the quote or whatever it is that is in the original question, um, what did it say? <laughs> where does that document or the quote, where does that come from? So what we're looking for here are uh, elements of did the students accurately reference constitutional text if it applied, constitutional principles, primary and secondary sources. Have students referenced historical events or potentially influential figures that demonstrates that they understand where that came from? Um, and then did students provide historical or current day examples or case studies that illustrate real world impact of the constitution or constitutional principles. So let's pretend that there was an opening, uh, an opening question that had something to do with um, Locke and Hobbes. Okay, so the students have probably answered um, some of the, the initial ideas in their opening statement uh, about, you know, who these people were, what were their philosophies, um, and how those philosophies uh, appear in the constitution. Okay. So in the course of the follow-up period, then the judges are probably looking for, okay, let's let's dig a little bit deeper. So what are there, what are some instances in which Locke's philosophy or Hobbes' philosophy, how does that play out in the modern world? What are some examples where we can see individual rights and the common good butting heads? Okay. So we would be looking in this case for evidence to say, okay, can the students provide us with examples of individual rights versus common good in a, in a modern era. So hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, and then they might reference specific elements of the Constitution. So when it comes to the Bill of Rights, um, they might be giving us some examples of First Amendment freedoms, that sort of thing. Um, and then there might be an opportunity for them to reference a historic event, or, or an individual figure, obviously Locke and Hobbes count for that. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for as we think through evidence. All right. So then the second category is analysis and understanding. So now we're looking to find out what, what do these different historical documents mean and according to whom. So if we're digging into um, you know, any other, let's see, sometimes the, the, um, the questions will ask about specific questions to do with a, um, Supreme Court case, so a landmark Supreme Court case, right? So once again, the students have probably answered the, the basic structure of what was this case, why was it, uh, why was it important, why do we consider it a landmark case in their opening statement. In the follow-ups, now we're looking to dig a little deeper. So, what what did that case mean at the time and according to who? So what was the immediate context of that particular judicial decision? Um, what were the different thoughts about it? So if we're talking about the Dred Scott case, what was the, the feeling or the thought of the majority? What was the feeling or the thought of the minority um, in that decision? So um, recognizing that there are different opinions and different interpretations, uh, at the time. Um, and then have students identified consequences of those interpretations. So, you know, clearly with Dred Scott, that's, that's a fairly, uh, it's a fairly obvious one to talk about um, the consequences of that decision, both in the short term and then in the long term. Um, so that's what we're looking for with analysis and understanding. So how, how well do we understand the facts of the case? who's involved, the different opinions, things of that nature. And it doesn't just have to be a Supreme Court case, that's just an example, but the, the questions will always lend themselves to an issue or a subject matter that there are different opinions about. <laughs> 
So um, for this one, I also want to make sure that it's very clear that the students are not expected to agree with either the issue on the table or with each other. So the questions are often asking students about their own opinion about that particular issue or the case or the quote or what have you. And it might be a circumstance in which the students do explain their collective opinion as a panel in the opening statement, but the students as a panel are three or four or five different people. So it might come out in the course of the follow-up that there are differing opinions amongst the panelists and that is 100% fine. So in fact, it might even behoove the students to say, we recognize that there were different opinions about this issue at the time that the quote, the case, whatever, at the time that it happened. And there are still differing opinions about what that means now. Emily, can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. Um, to go off Emily's current point about that disagreement in a historical context and within the unit, I always encourage my students if they're like to acknowledge that disagreement, at least in a, a minor way in the opening, um, because then I think it forces the students to then be able to say, OK, well, if you're going to mention this in the opening, you have to be ready for it in the follow up portion. Um, and so like I tell my students, you don't have to divide yourselves up into multiple perspectives, but if there is natural disagreement to even state in the opening, this panel is divided while some of us think this way, others think that way and present like the varying opinions as if they were the scholars talking about it. And I think from a student perspective, it helps them conceptualize those ideas and it makes them more confident talking about them. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's a great point. And the one other thing I'll say is um, a lot of times, um, even though one of the things we talked about when you're picking your units is maybe try to pick students that might disagree with each other a little bit. Sometimes we end up with units where we end up getting asked a question where they all do agree. Um, one of the things I always encourage my students to do in the follow up is even if they all do agree, they at least acknowledge that opposing viewpoint. Um, so we often use language like, you know, while we my students call each other colleagues when they're um, in competition. And so we say something to the effect of like, while I agree with my colleagues, an opposing viewpoint might be because um, something the judges are looking for is they want to make sure that your students understand the various perspectives on on these very important issues. And so even if the panel is, you know, cohesive in their viewpoints, um, it's important that for the judges, they acknowledge that there are other viewpoints and theirs isn't the only one. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, that's another important point. Um, okay, so category four is application. Um, so we've talked about what does the document say? What does it mean and according to who? And the application part is how does the interpretation of that document or the quote or the, <laughs> or the historical event, how does that apply now? Um, so we're looking at this point, have, have the students accurately addressed how that constitutional issue exists now? So what's the legal understanding of that issue right now? Um, what are some public policies that might apply to this particular issue, which is a big deal with that individual rights and common good question that I referenced before. Um, have students analyzed how constitutional provisions and principles can be applied to real world situations, um, policies, debates, contemporary issues, things like that. And then have students demonstrated familiarity with constitutional principles and frameworks from other countries or historical time periods um, using the different perspectives to add to their analysis. So to my earlier point, the issue of whether and how a student would reference an international example or an example from a different historical time period depends very heavily on the question that they are answering. There isn't always an international example, nor are we looking for one in most cases you all don't teach comparative constitutional law. <laughs> We're not asking you to. Um, but sometimes, especially with unit six, sometimes with unit one, we are looking for examples that have to do with in unit one, um, 
governmental history of ancient Greece, ancient Rome. We're also looking for the inspirations that we're getting from British government. So those are international examples. And then often in unit six, because it relates to the United States in a global context, sometimes there are appropriate opportunities to consider the influence of the United States on other governments, vice versa. Um, so this is just to say, if you have been assigned a question about due process of law, I don't need you to know about due process of law in Australia. We're good. <laughs> it just, it doesn't apply. So this is um, the way the rubric is written is meant to provide the judges with a bunch of possible examples that students may raise during the course of their follow-up questions. All right, and last but not least um, is a category called discussion. And in discussion, what we're looking for is how substantive was the discussion during the follow-up period. So this could look very different. The follow-up period is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, it is immediately evident to a judge um, or any volunteer that you have, you know, sitting across from the students. As soon as they ask the first question, it's real clear how well they understood the issue that was brought forward in the questions and how much how much original research they have actually done. So if the students, you know, copied something out of chat GPT or copied something off of Wikipedia and you ask them one of those first questions to probe their thought a little further and the judges are just getting you know, crickets, <laughs> or or just a single student is answering every one of the questions. Okay, so this is not a particularly substantive discussion. But if we have a situation, which we really hope to build, where the judges are asking different questions, and we have opportunities to hear from each of the panelists, and those panelists are, are adding to the discussion, potentially raising new issues, potentially raising disagreements that they've had amongst themselves as a panel. Um, all of those things are, are perfectly good. We're looking for that. Um, so we're also looking for, you know, obviously factual accuracy here as well. So have the students um, provided appropriate evidence? Um, have they provided good examples that are appropriate examples? Um, have they had additional thoughtful insights over the course of that discussion? Um, you know, so a judge is not going to get real hung up about, you know, if, if we mis misattribute a quote, like, okay, it's, that's not a big deal. It's something else if we're now, if we're attributing the thought process of, of Hobbes to Locke and Locke to Hobbes, like, okay, now that's kind of a problem. <laughs> Um, but that kind of thing is going to come out over the course of the, the discussion. And if a judge is asking for, you know, can you give me, um, can you give me a modern example of an instance in which you think citizens voting rights might be unnecessarily limited, something like that. And the, the students are just, you know, crickets, <laughs> Then, then the judges will will know. But obviously, when they when they're asking questions like that, you know, they're ask, they're offering the the opportunity for the students to build on each other's um, build on each other's arguments and potentially build on something that they brought up in their opening statement. Uh, one thing that Ashley and Megan talked about uh, in session one or two, I'm not I don't remember which anymore. Um, was the idea of building an opening statement that leaves the breadcrumb trail that reference makes certain references to cases or examples, but does not go into them in great detail during the opening statement on purpose because they're trying to get the judges to use those avenues to start the follow-up question uh, conversation. Yes, you definitely want to do that for yourself because here's the thing, the part that's always the scariest for students and honestly the scariest for us as teachers because it's not like in a sports game where we can call time out. Um, we just have to sit there and listen to the crickets sometimes and it's god awful terrifying. Um, but if you leave those breadcrumbs, it will hopefully at 
hopefully guarantee that your kids get at least maybe one, maybe two questions that they're that they know they can answer. Um, and that always helps build their confidence during the question, the question and answer, the follow up period. And honestly, that's the part that the students are most afraid of, um, because they don't know what's coming. Um, we can only prepare them so much for that. And, you know, I can ask them a thousand and one questions and maybe not a single one will get asked of them um, when they get in front of judges, but hopefully something similar to what I asked or on the same topic or concept will get asked and that will help um, build their confidence um, during that Q and A period. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I also want to point out for for middle school teachers or even upper elementary school teachers like this might look really scary like oh my gosh how can i possibly get all my students to you know to to check these different boxes these are really general categories of information that judges are looking for and so you know even if we're talking about middle school students one of the fixed questions for level 2 um in in unit 6 for example it asks about you know what are some what are some opportunities for citizen engagement in the 21st century? It's a pretty open-ended question, you know, and if, if the students are able to build on the discussion in the, the follow-up period where they talk about, you know, okay, obviously there's voting as an example, um, you know, but then the judge might ask, okay, well, what if you're not old enough to vote or, you know, perhaps you're a non-citizen, what are your options for participation? And the students can give you examples like, you know, participating in, in civil society, um, you know, working on an issue that matters to you, things like that. Like, yes, these are all logical, well-supported reasoning <laughs> to, to answer those questions. So um, it, it is built to be used uh, with all levels of students. So, all right. Um, are there, oh, I guess I'll point this out first. There is a student-friendly version of the rubric, and Ashley and Megan have very, very helpfully uh, put in the chat our rubric link. Um, we've also, she's linked the student explanation. So the student version of the document really lays out for the students, what is this project that we're asking you to do, number one. <laughs> and then it also explains what we're asking of the student in each of those categories. And then they can also see what the judge's document looks like. So um, they can look at that from the beginning. And, and, you know, if we're thinking about this in terms of what do we want the end result to be, you know, explaining that and putting that in front of students from the beginning is about the, the easiest way you can start. Um, okay, so I do want to go back at this point and um, get to that video, because now that we've walked through those five categories, um, I'd like to take a look at some students in action and see what we think. So I will say this, the question for these students is extraordinarily long. <laughs> it is a three part question, but my goodness, they had a lot they had a lot they had to chew on. Um, so I will not, I'm going to go ahead and skip the video to where the students actually start talking. Um, but the question that they're answering is, what are classical republicanism and natural rights philosophy? How do they influence the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights? Which of the two philosophies has prevailed in the United States since the founding? And what contemporary conditions of American society can be attributed to the tension between the two philosophies. So that being said, let me get to- Let me go in the place. You may be seated. Natural law is the science of which alone can tell us on what conditions mankind can live in peace. Because of each person's ability to utilize reason, man has recognized a law by which each person is equal in dignity under that law. Through reasoning, this law must exist as a protection of each individual and is necessary to keep peace. Included in this law are the rights to life, liberty, property, and, pursuit, and the pursuit of happiness, all of which are recognized in the Declaration of Independence. This theory of classical liberalism, the protection of natural rights by limitation of government, is the belief that no individual is a subordinate. This was affirmed in our Declaration of Independence by saying that all men are created equal. 
The declaration also references natural rights, which justify the ability to appeal to heaven and disband from any unjust government and create one that protects individual rights. This was the founders' general belief on creating our government, saying in the Declaration of Independence that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The Anti-Federalists claim that these rights must be enumerated into the beginning of the Constitution to ensure that the government will not abridge these rights. Thomas Paine stated that government should have limitations and enumerated powers because a principle found in nations suggests that the more simple government is, the less liable it is to be disordered. Aristotle believed that human beings are not self-sufficient and are always found living in association with one another in a form of legal rule. Because of this interpretation, a government that promotes the general, general welfare and common good of its people is the best type. To do so, this government must promulgate morality and civic virtue through education to ensure that everybody will strive for the great end, which Aristotle believed to be happiness for all. According to classical thinkers, republicanism can only exist in small, uniform communities. The federalist system proposed by Madison would allow for these small communities to have a voice on a national and national government. There would be a balance of power between states and the national government, having representatives from small communities act as delegates for their beliefs on a large scale. Hamilton's idea of an electoral college would also allow for these small communities to have a voice in our elections. The Constitution provides the government many powers to promote the common good. Examples of this would be the welfare clause and state government's ability to police to use police powers. The two conflicting philosophies, classical liberalism and classical republicanism, were combined by the great thinkers of our country. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison recognized that a republic was the best type of government, but they both both believed that agrarian aspects of life demanded individualism. Systems such as capitalism allow for individuals to act alone while still benefiting society through self-enlightenment and a sort of forced altruism. The ideas of classical republicanism and natural rights are combined in the Bill of Rights with the founder's interpretation that universal good is best achieved by the protection of natural rights. The principle of the common good and the principle of individual rights do sometimes conflict with each other, as some interpretations of the common good put security above liberty, and some put liberty above security. One example of hiking our security over liberty was the passage of the Patriot Act after the 9 11 attacks. The idea is that the government would protect its citizens by restricting certain, uh, certain liberties, but the founders believed that the security of citizens would require the protection of individual liberties. Our nation has progressively moved away from this inter interpretation as we lose the understanding of the fundamental importance of liberty. The problem with the current interpretation is that when we must exchange liberty for security in the name of the common good, is that the common good is subjective. To protect all interpretations of good, the individual's liberties must be protected because individuals make up both the minority and the majority. As Benjamin Franklin stated, those who give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. We are now in all of Thank you. Is it 300 million or so plus or minus people in America today? Is it possible to have republicanism in, in our diverse society? Uh, are you referring to classical yeah. principles? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I completely believe that uh, classical republicanism ideas are uh, easily implemented into any form of society. Um, there's kind of this common thought that um, classical republicanism is interpreted in small communities and just small communities alone. But I believe that um, no matter if you're in New York or our home state of Montana, that you find um, kind of a developed sense of community, uh, smaller communities within large communities. So, so you have, I would say that you have, uh, I was just in San Francisco last week, and an example of that would be the fact that they have Chinatown, which is uh, tends to be typically like-minded people who share like-minded values. And an example of classical republicanism of today that we do have in a nation, as we say in our prepared marks, is a federal system where uh, states which are represented or represent small communities can have a voice on a national scale through the electoral college. And there are areas where we do see classical republicanism at work and uh, in tension with natural rights. Um, I, I believe this to be in the uh, public school setting. Um, we, we do promote um, education. It is provided by the, by the federal government, but there are certain limitations on what can be educated. Um, you can't educate religion, for instance, um, because of this individual right that is provided by natural, um, natural rights. And uh, to elaborate on what my colleague says, um, another sort of uh, kind of 
a typical um, characteristic of classical republicanism, it would be moral education. And obviously, uh, schools, because morality is a means different thing to a lot of people. That's why we don't have state implemented religion or government implemented religion whatsoever. Um, I believe that communities do have a certain role in enforcing uh, a certain type of moral education just because of like minded communities sharing usually the same knowledge. Yes, yeah, I, I have a question that's a bit along those lines, but you said that simple government is less liable to be disordered. Mm -hmm. The modern U.S. government is probably, I don't know anyone that define it as simple. <laughs> um, so is it disordered from natural rights and classical republicanism? And if so, what would you do to restore that? Um, absolutely. I, I was actually talking about this with some of my colleagues, and I actually have set up a, a hierarchy. I believe that we have actually moved away from the checks and balances that are implemented in the system. And we now um, have the executive branch being the most powerful, the judicial being the second, and the legislative branch being the third. Um, I believe that uh, the legislative branch has almost uh, given up most of its powers to these um, through the workings of interpretation of the judicial branch. And uh, the ability for the executive branch to quasi-legislate along with the judicial branch is an example of this. Um, we have uh, unelected people within our government who are making laws. And um, this is an example of something that Thomas Paine would have thought would be disordered. Um, and to elaborate on what Michael said, um, just basically with with the uh, interpretation of classical republicanism and natural rights philosophy within our government, you actually do see a shift uh, between the two. They're, uh, they're sort of on, on a pendulum all the time where we either uh, advocate for collective rights or we advocate for individual rights. And usually it doesn't seem um, as if they're at the same time, but because of having the two together and because of having the uh, two kind of represented in our government, that's what makes us strong and that's what, where we need to find an equal balance. What did uh, Rock and Jefferson in specific and founders in general think about the relationship between natural rights and religion? How did they see religion as part of the national rights natural rights discussion uh, so Locke was what is called a voluntarist when it comes to natural law which means he thought natural law required a natural law maker and jefferson was very similar in that uh, he believed that although religion should not be forced on someone he also believed that it does play somewhat of a role in government due to his belief that natural law which is what government is in state to enforce uh, he believes since that is true then religion does play some uh, sort of role in government um, and we just actually went to uh, the Jefferson Memorial, and we, one of the quotes provided there on the wall suggests that though he does believe in God, he believes enforcing a religion on a certain person is actually against um, his belief and his religious system itself. And he thinks that coercing someone into his beliefs is, goes against liberty and every principle that we have discovered under this natural Theory of law. Uh, I answer uh, what Michelle had said um, from the reading I was doing uh, just recently out of our textbook. Um, all of the founding fathers seem to kind of represent Judeo Christian values. Um, however, that they realized because of forced religion, because of uh, because of Britain, where they're coming from, uh, from the perspective of tyranny, that imposing state religion and imposing anybody to do anything that they don't want to is just simply. Can, can you have natural rights philosophy? Uh, can you have a natural rights um, government without a belief in God? Is it... so. yeah. Absolutely. Um, Aquinas would have actually believed this. Aquinas was one of the philosophers that brought this forward. He believed that um, individuals could be moral without natural law. Uh, he, he thought that there was this understanding that is almost learned. It, it's kind of like the Freudian sense of it versus ego. It is kind of like this inherent thing that we have, and ego is learned. And among individuals, um, everyone has this ability to recognize that we have the same capabilities, and this makes us equal under this law. And uh, what you just described is what is called a generalist, which is similar to the voluntarists. But they don't exactly say that. Uh, to describe natural law, uh, you need they they think that uh, natural law. If you were to describe natural law, uh, you do not need to use religion. They don't think that it doesn't require religion, but they think that you can describe it without using it. Very good. Alrighty, so um, I'm gonna pick on Ashley and Megan a little bit. Um, <laughs> all right, so how would we? Um, how would we assess their opening statement? And I'll put the opening. Um, let's see. Did they did they answer all elements of the question? Yes. 
And uh, one one thing I'll say about this is um, sometimes students will, because um, <clears throat> the way the questions are written, if you click the hearing question link, there's like a bold and then a bullet one and then a bullet two. And some students, especially the ones that are very, like I say, Englishy, they will push back on you and want to like fluff it and move it around and stuff like that. And I always encourage my students, answer the bold, answer bullet one, answer bullet two, because even though it might not written look that great the judges don't get a written copy of your statement so if you're bouncing all over the place it's going to be harder for them to know like and have like cue words like you don't have to restate the question because you don't want to waste your precious four minute time doing that but have cues where it's very obvious that when you switch from the bold to the bullet it's a couple of words that they immediately know you've moved to bullet one and they immediately know you've moved to bullet two and that will help the judges um they can focus on what you're saying more than trying to figure out what part of the question you're in. I agree. Um, I always yell at my students for like what I call signposts, kind of those cues, but I cannot uh, overstate enough the importance of transition phrases in an opening statement. It'll save your students so much time to focus on more specific content. And you know, it's simple things, next, therefore, moreover like likewise differently on the other hand as silly as it sounds and like as minor of a detail as it sounds that can replace an entire introductory sentence sometimes and so they catch the judges you know like ears because you're having a clear statement that you're moving on to the next thing um, without having to write out as what emily called very long questions in the former sentences and a lot of times that first bold question, the question is like, if, especially we're going to talk about this in a second, but like if it's a question with a quote, usually the question is, do you agree or disagree? Yes. No. Like, be clear, like have them say like, yes, we agree. No, we disagree. Like, it, it seems weird to be that blunt but be that blunt right out of the gate so that while they're listening to all your evidence, they're not going, okay, is this evidence supporting that they agree or they disagree? Um, you know, if you teach AP um, at the high school level, or even if you're teaching for like a, a state assessment, we tell students, if the reader has to guess what you're thinking, they're not going to give you the points. Same thing with this. If the judges have to guess what you're thinking or where your train of thought is going, you're not going to get the points. Thank you. Yes, very important points all around. Um, so in, in the case of these uh, particular students, they had a lot to, to chew on, but they did manage to get through all the elements of that question. We did hear from all the panelists in the opening statement. And Ashley and Megan, what do you feel about number three? How, what was the quality of their opening statement in terms of their approach, their references, uh, the variety of references, things of that nature? What do you think? That's some bad. They have some quotes yeah. in there. Um, if if these were my students, I would want them to have a little bit more evidence um, in in the statement. Um, I always tell them for anything they're going to say, they need to have something that just isn't what they think um, in there to support it. Um, and the other thing I'll say that kind of goes with the second bullet on here about the participation. The one thing that they did do really well is that, like Emily said, they had to get a lot of stuff in four minutes, but they weren't talking so fast that you couldn't follow what they were saying. Like, it's important, like some, some of my students will come to me and they'll be like, oh, well, we have four and a half pages written, but we can get it done in four minutes. And I'm like, yeah, how fast are you talking? So again, judges can only hear you. They cannot see the statement. So if you are running a rat race um, to get in under that four minute mark um, and they can't, they can't follow you, um, it doesn't work. And I think this panel did a good job of um, going back and forth between each other um, during the um, during the four minute statement, because there's a lot of benefit to all the students speaking more than once. Um, but you don't want it to be so much of a popcorn that like every other sentence a kid is switching because, you know, uh, judges I've heard judges say before, like um, I was getting neck strain going back and forth, like trying to bounce between how many of you were talking all at once. So it's good that you have that, but you want to make sure that it's well paced. I agree. Like, and this is just my own scoring. This is not like officially like Center for Civic Education approved. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. If that panel was my set of students, I think I'd give them like 
a five, maybe a six for this opening statement. It addresses the question. Everyone spoke. Um, but again, going back to Ashley's point, I think there is too much for my liking theoretical and not enough concrete application of it. Um, and this is a good example of leaving those bread crumbs where they could even introduce, you know, such as this and then leave it as a drop in and hope that the judges would be like, well, okay, in your discussion of classical republicanism, you mentioned the Patriot Act. Tell me more about it or, or whatever it might be. So I think that is where I would encourage my students to be more specific in the process. And then going back to Ashley's point about jumping around. My units this year are going to be between three and four people in size. Um, so I usually tell them in a four minute opening statement um, in a group of four, everyone needs to speak at least twice. So break it down into chunks where there might be eight speaking parts um, or six or seven, where maybe a couple of people speak three times, someone else speaks two times, depending on their comfortability, just reading an entire paragraph in one setting for one student, if it's like a minute long, it takes forever. They look like they're going to pass out because they haven't breathed for an entire minute. Um, so that I, I, I've i seen students like turn red in the face because they're like trying to get out. I'm like, breathe, breathe, breathe. <laughs> um, so that would be my recommendation here. It's a, it's a solid opening. It just could be more detailed. All right. How do y'all feel about uh, the category of evidence that they presented in the follow-up q and I thought I actually enjoyed their follow-up more than their opening. Um, they brought up a lot more evidence than they did in the opening. Like I said, I wish they would have done the drop-ins for some of that ahead of time. One of the things I always look for in a hearing is students being able in the follow-up to refer to and recall and connect like the critical pieces that like the must know pieces about a particular topic, which they did. They were talking about Locke. Um, they talked about Aristotle, I believe, in the follow-up. But then I also love to like encourage my students and I look for those kind of like out of the blue connections that a lot of students might not go to right away because the textbook doesn't cover it because it might take a little bit more research. And for me, that was the Aquinas reference. Like maybe it's because I was Catholic school educated K through 12 and went to a Catholic college too. But like I heard Thomas Aquinas, I'm like, ooh. And then he got into like this super id and the ego. And I'm like, I love this. So that is, I, I thought the evidence was stronger in follow-up. I would agree. And the other thing, um, this is a, this is a unit one uh, team and the, the hardest thing for unit one is current events. And the hardest thing for unit six is historical. Um, that's why we mentioned in prep, you should pair those kiddos together so they can help each other. Um, and I think in their follow-up, um, it wasn't like real heavy or anything, but they did reference um, some current events examples, which is really hard to do in unit one and really hard to do it well. Um, any kid can drop a current event about, you know, civic virtue, for example, but to connect it back to that historical content, that's the difficult piece. Um, that's taking it to the next level um, that really makes a difference. And I, um, I was not Catholic school educated, but I did have to go and do my up downs every Sunday um, with my grandma. So uh, I love that too. And see, that's the thing. Um, you tell students if they're really passionate about a particular thing, they should definitely bring it out because, um, you never know when you're going to appeal to a judge. Um, you might not even intend to, and you do. And frankly, it makes a difference. At nationals, one of the things I always love is when judges give my students feedback, like we haven't heard that example today. Like we're really glad, like that's always, even if I know like collectively the unit wasn't as strong as I wish they would have been, that's such great feedback to hear from a student's perspective, because it shows that all of this hard work paid off yes. and that those passions that they followed or those really minor details that they were just desperate to bring out showed how strong of a critical thinker they are. Yes, exactly. All right. So how do we feel about their analysis and understanding during the follow-up period? I think the accuracy was there. I think that um, 
if this these were my students, I would use the phrase, um, you kind of beat around the bush a little bit. Um, so a lot of times you only get six or eight minutes depending on the level of competition. And if you have three to four or sometimes even five or six students, you need to get to the point quickly. Um, and like the first student that spoke in the follow up, and this kind of goes with discussion a little bit too, but you know, she had to clarify, which is fine, but then kind of like rolling a little bit and then got to the question. Like I really, you really want to focus with your students on, um, getting to getting to the point as quickly as possible so their colleagues can jump in um and and add to it um or if you know it's going to be like a sometimes judges they're not supposed to do this but sometimes they ask like multi-part questions don't let one kid answer the whole thing with all the analysis like let it move around a little bit um and then i'm not really sure there was a lot of opportunities for them in these questions that they were asked for multiple perspectives but um and that's that's not their fault so um but i always try to get them to bring those out um if there's any way to do so yeah i um not surprisingly agree with ashley on all of that i do want to say however um, like this video is from the national competition. So my saying before about the opening or us saying that the evidence was stronger than maybe the analysis or understanding of it is from a, like the national competition is the final stage, right? It's held in April. Um, students should have been doing this for like months in advance, like preparing and practicing these skills through at least a state competition and maybe even like in school or district-wide competitions as well, or regional, excuse me. And so like my students are preparing for their very first like hearing right now. They have never done it before. So if I would have heard this like right now at the beginning of October, I'd be like, that's pretty good. Like, yes. right. Yeah, I would be thrilled yes. in October if my students do this. If they do it in April or May and they're still at that level, I think that's where Ashley and I have the like benefit of seeing it all the way through, which is also a great thing. Like if you show your students this video or something like it from the national finals, let them know, like, this is what we are working towards by state. This is what we want to do to go beyond that for nationals to try to step up the level of competition. That being said, um, the time thing concerns me with this unit. They take way too long to answer the question. I always encourage my students, and we practice this a ton, to use, it's um, like if you teach AP or you're familiar with like short scaffolded answer questions, um, the ACE format. Answer the question, cite an example, explain the example. And I was like, you always have to start with the answering the question. Yes, no, whatever. And then you should be able to do that. I don't like to limit them to three sentences, but like you should be able to do that in 30 seconds or less. And after you stop at one example and after you stop at one explanation, breathe because that gives your unit members time to build on what you said with an additional example or an additional perspective. Um, and I think this unit could have been tighter in doing that. Yep, that's a that's a fair point. So yeah, I think I think you all have, have hit it quite well. But um, yes, part of the reason we use that video is that the sound quality was actually pretty good. There's a <laughs> lot of recordings of we the people out there. Many of them are very hard to hear. <laughs> Okay, so then finally, uh, well, almost finally, application. So have the students applied their understanding of these issues appropriately? This one's hard because this is kind of like a new category to the rubric a little bit. Like it used to be more combined with analysis. So when I watched this before um, we did this today, I was trying to like parse these two out from an from analysis and they're very similar and they have like there's just some slight nuances um so for me <clears throat> i definitely think that they address the questions that were asked um and we talked a little bit about um how megan and i would you know want to see a little bit more in in our lovelies um but i think that for this piece I think it's just important that your students are more um, intentional about this piece, meaning like if you're going to address, um, uh, you know, a court interpretation or if you're going to address a policy, 
name it, you know, name the justice that had that opinion. Like if, if we ever get another question, hint, hint, wink, wink, would love another question um, about like dissenting opinions um, or something like that in unit four, like you best be citing Ginsburg and Scalia somewhere. You best be using their names if you're talking about, you know, the dissents of the court. So I just think for this application piece, it's, it's about clearly intentionally identifying what you're talking about, but then you're saying, this is why this matters now. Like if we're using the example of dissents, you know, why do dissents matter today? Why did the Plessy dissent matter to Justice Earl Warren? Like, I think a lot of people, you know, those kinds of things, that's where that uh, that apply moves away from the analysis piece. And I would think, um, Megan, I use ACE as well. And I would say that this piece falls in that explain of ACE. Um, but there you go. I will also, I, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, Emily. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really good point. And, you know, because of course the students prepared this under, you know, a, a former version of the rubric that did not have this category. And because the students answered that question prior to the pandemic. So I think you ask that same question now, you get a very different response, especially 100%. when you think about application. So to be fair, this one is a little bit yeah. fair for us to totally assess, but- right. um, I think for the example, I think you pointed it out earlier that the students brought up the Patriot Act in the opening statement, but weren't pressed further on it, that that probably would have been a good avenue for the judges to pursue further, um, but the judges didn't choose to go there. And just for example, if they would have pressed further, like I would have liked to have heard more specifics, you know, throwing out the Patriot Act as this like good example of classical Republican policy over natural rights is fine, but the Patriot Act was huge. It had several different elements to it. So I would have liked to have pressed further as a judge to ask about which elements they thought were particularly egregious. And you know, the very, very top students are gonna be able to say section 245 or whatever. I'm not as worried about that, but if they can talk about like overextension of wiretapping or my favorite is always digging into library records, um, got to protect the librarians. And so that that next level of questioning would have fit perfectly for this category. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then we'll do this one quick. So discussion, they did a great job with mm -hmm. discussion. They built on each other's arguments beautifully. They shared the floor, which was also really nice to see. <laughs> Um, and they were very clearly, I mean, I, the, I would like to build on what my colleague just said or however they, they phrased it. So they were very clearly trying to add something. So a lot of times what some students will default to is I agree with my colleague and I'm going to restate what they just said in a slightly different way. Okay. This time they were adding something more substantive every time they added on to a, a previous person's statement. Did y'all have anything else you wanted to add about that? Nope. Okay, cool. All right, so let me skip ahead then. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this year's questions. And so we're gonna take a look at a couple of different ones, but given the categories of the rubric, um, we thought it would be useful to break down a couple of questions from this year's set and talk about how we might approach that with our students. So, I'm gonna change this. And I put the link to this year's uh, questions in the chat. So if you just go there and it should be the top link just where you see Emily click, that's where you're gonna click and you should be able to have this open um, on your computer as well. Okay, so I'm gonna remind myself, um, unit two, let's walk through that one first. Okay, unit two, take it away. <laughs> um, I can talk about this one. So. Um, if we're looking at the two types of questions, as you page through, especially if you look at the unit two questions, at least one of the questions in unit two, which is question three, has a quote directly embedded in the question. Um, question two for unit two also kind of inadvertently does that by asking students to refer to Brutus one and Federalist 10 when talking about the issue of factions. But for 
the purpose of this conversation, I'm really going to be focusing on question three in unit two. Um, Emily and Ashley and I already referenced this a bit earlier, but when we look at this question during the ratification debates, one writer claimed most men seem to agree that amendments ought to be made and the proposed plan in some stage of the business. What were the major disagreements between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists during the ratification period over the need to amend the proposed constitution? What I have found in my experience is that students see a quote and they skip right past it and go to the question. Um, and what I always tell them in that situation is the authors of the questions put that quote there for a reason. Um, and then if you look even below the question, it has a citation of the quote and a link to the actual primary source expert from which the quote it was pulled. So if the Center for Civic Education is giving you all of this information, that should be a hint, as I tell my students, that you should probably read the full thing, or at least that excerpt that they connected to. Um, and so with this in mind, what I always encourage students to do is after they try to like chew on what the question is asking, start first by reading the primary source. Um, number one, that gives them a good context for what the author is saying in the quoted piece. And number two, what you might find is that later or earlier in that quoted um, primary source, the author makes further statements or arguments that could help guide you into what the varying debates of the day were about the potential of adding amendments to the Constitution. So if we think about the rubric from a sense that both during the opening and follow-up, students should be able to make a clear argument, but also then because of the nature of the question, they have to identify the major disagreements between both anti-federalists and federalists. Going to the primary source, not just for background knowledge, but also referencing that further is critical here. Um, I always like to tell them that, you know, you should start in your response like in the intro, I like to tell them you should be referencing an old wig eight, right? And you might not have to directly quote it, but reference that idea. And then somewhere later in the opening, I also encourage them to say, what's another argument that old wig eight made that you could incorporate into that and then show the similarity or difference from another anti-federalist paper or conversely from a federalist response to those criticisms. Um, so to me, this, I actually really love this question. I'm a big Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate nerd. I know Ashley is as well. Um, but I think that is the challenge there. I like it. I like quotes with questions, uh, questions with quotes, excuse me, um, because it kind of even gives a hint of like where students should go in the early stages and what they should carry throughout their written response and the follow-up. It's also a good way where if they only mention this part of Old Wig 8, they could save the other arguments for follow-up and put those little breadcrumbs in, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, so I'll stop there. Ashley or Emily, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so I, I will just simply point out that um, the follow-up or the bullets in this particular question are super open-ended. Um, so in your opinion, what side made, made, the, made the most compelling argument why? So the students are, are likely to probably choose one um, and then go down that road during the opening statement. But during that follow-up period, then we might dig into that a little bit further. So, I mean, if they decide, well, the anti-federalists made the most compelling arguments, okay, great. What were the federalist responses? That's what I would probably start with if I was um, looking for a follow-up question. Um, and then the second bullet, should we consider changing the amendment process? Why or why not? Again, the students are by necessity going to choose one avenue for their opening, but the avenue they did not choose is probably one that I would go down that road in the follow-up period. So really looking to see, okay, do we understand both sides of the issue? Um, and then, the application possibility for the second bullet is also huge. Okay, so if we just, <laughs> number one, should we consider changing it? If they say yes, okay, what do you think it should be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
do you think that your solution would be acceptable to enough of the majority of the American public that that this would be acceptable, right? So it's not, it becomes further than just like a, a thought experiment, but then thinking about like, okay, in reality, how might that look? Um, so I just will point that out as if I'm thinking about where, where might this question go as a potential judge, um, then that's what I would really be thinking about. And remember, like we tell, I tell my students every day in every situation, but, you know, identifying a problem is great, but it's not helpful unless you pose a solution. And so for everything that they say, yes, we should change, or this is an issue, or the government hasn't done a great job at this. Okay, then what should we do next? Like Emily mentioned, should be the automatic next step. Uh, all right, Ashley, we're looking at unit three. Yeah. yeah. You look at three. Let's look at um. Let's look at Q one. All right. So um, unit three um got the shaft with the quotes in this first round of questions this year. Usually they have a whole bunch, um, but um. So there are a lot of questions that aren't going to have a direct quote and aren't going to have any citations. So um, I want to look at and sometimes that makes these questions harder um because the quotes give you kind of a direction and a source to go to, whereas these you're kind of just out in the open. You've got to find. Um, your information. So if we're looking here at Q1, in what ways was the due process clause of the 14th Amendment interpreted by the courts in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War? So before students can even write this question, they have to figure two things out. First of all, they have to realize it's about specifically the due process clause. There's more than one clause in the 14th Amendment. And usually when people think about the 14th Amendment, they think about equal protection. Um, so it's not about that clause. It's about the other one. And then um, the center was super friendly um, and said immediate aftermath. Wow, not vague at all. So what is the immediate aftermath? Are we talking 10 years? Are we talking 20 years? Are we talking 50? You know, all those things. So you've got to figure out how you're going to, by you, I mean the students, how the students are going to interpret what they consider immediate aftermath um, before they can even start to tackle this question. Um, the other new, um, I wouldn't say it's a new, but um, the center seems really to be loving these to what extent questions this year, because I've seen a bunch of them throughout the units. And so rather than just a one or the other, to what extent leaves you like a third option um, to talk about? Because you can say not at all, absolutely, or well, maybe a little bit in this situation, but not so much in this situation. So whenever you see that to what extent um, opener, um, they may be able to, I mean, I always tell my students, don't be a fence sitter on the issues, but when you're talking about to what extent, it's a spectrum. So you might not be solely one way or the other with these. Um, this question is also a good example of while they all three parts go together, they're asking three really distinct questions. So that's where Megan's suggestion of a quick transition word um, in between your bold bullet one and bullet two is going to be really important because you're talking about due process clause as it relates to judicial interpretation. Then they're jumping into everyone's favorite uh, substantive due process. And then they're flipping the switch and going to, OK, now I want you to talk about the incorporation doctrine as it relates to rights. So, again, all three pieces are connected. They're not like totally, uh, you know, um, out in the world um, from each other, but they are three very distinct questions. Unlike if you look at the Q2 here, um, where they talk about the origins of political parties, and then the first bullet, we're still talking about political parties. And then the third, second bullet, we're still talking about the functions of political parties. So where this Q2, they all kind of match to one another, which whenever students get a question like that, um, I always tell them, you kind of need to write this together when that's the point, um, because you got to have you got to know what the person's writing about the bold to be able to answer the second bullet whereas with this q1 three different students could probably tackle these questions and then kind of try to mold them together with those transitions and things like that so those are some other things to look for um, when you're um, having students write their testimony is how much do they need to be in communication with each other about what they're writing before they do a draft versus can they actually kind of do their own little mini draft and then come back together um, to talk about it? Megan. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. One of the things that 
I do in preparation for the state competition is I have students like choose a kind of like a triage method, looking at the questions, which one do they think is the most challenging? Do that one first, because you have the most amount of time. And so looking at the unit three questions, the fact that we have two civil war questions, I would often tell them like, maybe do those back to back or do the hardest one first and then save the other civil war question for later on, because at least if nothing else, if they're doing Q1 first, then they should have context from before, during, and after the Civil War that they can then apply to the Lincoln um, oath of office question or vice versa. So just, you know, when you're thinking about how do I maximize student time and efforts, that might be something to consider. But otherwise, I agree with everything Ashley said about the questions. That's well. a great point as well. And there's always lots of Civil War questions in Unit 3. Heads up. It's my U.S. history buff section. Yes, like, that's where I put all my U.S. and two as well. Yep. Units two and three are where you put all your history buffs. Yep. Four tends to be questions about structure, government structure. Five is the heavy into the Bill of Rights. Um, and then six, six could go in any number of directions. Yeah. And four, uh, the writers of four really like quotes. Scroll up for a second, Emily. Just let them see that Q1 quote. Yeah, there you go. That's a fun one. Um, so, um, but you get lots of lots of references. Um, but yeah, usually the writers of the Q4, they're big fans of the elongated quotes, shall we say. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So we have Alito in question one, Madison in question two, three has no quote. Um, yeah, two. that was nice. Yeah, two also has Hamilton because they cite Fed 78 in, in or excuse me, in one as well. So Mm -hmm. get a little of it all there's there's plenty of quotes no mm -hmm. there. I just really love q2 because they asked about the 17th amendment being repealed yes which like personally I I love the 17th amendment um and I remember reading like an article about a small group wanting to overturn it um I can't remember which state it was now a few years ago and I was like ah oh, this must be like you know some out there proposition and then when I saw it in this question I'm like oh yes let's let's debate the 17th amendment yep that's a good one yeah it's it's one that I don't I don't think it has come up in a long time it's yeah. been a long time yeah okay so those are just some some snips of um of this year's questions. So if you were, you know, Ashley and Megan, if you were in a classroom setting, how would we go about breaking down any of these questions for the students? Yeah, so in terms of breaking down the question, this is a formal like one or two day step at the beginning of the preparation for any opening response and preparation for follow-up for a question. Um, I usually give my students some type of document that asks them to summarize the questions in their own words, the main and the two bullet questions, and then also to start taking note of what they know and what they don't know. So what are the key terms that you see? Do you have working definitions of them now? If they don't, that's a road, you know, that's a roadblock. We need to fix that first. And then I asked them to start really brainstorming what they already know about the topic from a contextual perspective, a historical perspective, um, a legal and constitutional perspective, and then a contemporary perspective. Um, and so they sometimes become very uncomfortable early on with that because they're like, well, what if I don't know anything? That's fine. But I bet you do know something. Um, I'm teaching seniors. And so they had U.S. history as juniors. I bet there is something you remember from U.S. history that applies in some way, even if you don't remember how it applies, but you remember this event applies. Put that down on the sheet because then that will be your guide for, OK, if we have a lot of contemporary connections, let's hold off on researching that. If we're struggling with context and historical applications, let's start there. Let's get the background. And so this step is really important from my perspective because it will set the process going of where they should look next. And I'll just say um, nine times out of 10, 
something about the question is in the textbook. And kind of like Megan was saying how um, students see a quote, they move past it and go to the question. I can't tell you how many, it's just a nature of this generation of students. They see a question, they immediately go to Google. And I'm like, well, or and something on the internet. It's like, well, why don't you check the book first? Um, it's been a long time since there's been a question that there was nothing in the We the People book related to the question. P.S. It was unit six on Indian tribes. Um, but anyways, it's been several years since they've had a question where there was literally nothing in the We the People book that would have helped you answer that question. They've gotten really good at they don't want you to be able to find everything in the book. That's not the point. Um, but make them start with the book. Um, it makes sense, especially if you're teaching um, and teach from the book, like use some of the stuff. And we talked about that more in session one and session two, but um, have them use the stuff that's in there because they didn't write the textbook for us not to use it. Yes. And, and I think that really goes to supporting evidence on the second half of this slide. Yes. Like, if they talk about it in the text, which 90% of the 99% of the time it will be, go there for the must know examples, right? Like the people writing the questions work specifically with the Center for Civic Education to write them and correlate with the text, the corresponding text. And so to me, the textbook is always the first step. Go to the book, go to the constitution. What do you know? If they mention 14th Amendment, for like due process, you have to know that. You should probably be at least mentioning the 14th Amendment, if not digging deeply into it for that opening statement and beyond into the follow-up. So that's usually my first checklist of must know information and supporting evidence. Yes, and uh, so I'll just point out, this is absolutely 100% true for the middle school questions as it is for the high school ones. The high school ones just have the, the change every year. Um, as far as their content and the middle school ones are fixed, um, which are in the back of the, the teacher edition. Um, it's the exact same process for middle school. So we're, we're not going to ask you something with the outlier example of the question about Indian tribes. We're not going to ask the question that the students can't start from the textbook. Um, that just seems kind of unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always going to start there. And then the other thing that the, the committee also works really hard to do is if there are references to other materials, that those other materials don't require you to have to buy a book, that they need to be as universally accessible as possible. So um, just to, to back up Megan's point from earlier, there's a citation that's accessible for a reason. <laughs> um, I can take the starting research process sure. as well. Since yeah, because that's going to roll into the next one, I think. So, yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> in the beginning, <laughs> I mean, I'm always pretty structured about how my students should conduct research um, just because they are high school seniors. And of course, they're going to, it should be, they should be able to do more of it on their own. But you know, they're still learning the government principles at the same time. So I always like to start them off with reliable sources first that I've used that have been tested by previous students each year at the end of the year. I ask my outgoing class to give me like, what else should I add to this document? So Emily, if you could click on the link under the starting research process for me, please. I hope I did it right. We'll find out. Okay, so this is going to take you to um, a document that I have created over the years and give to my We the People students at the beginning of any research process. It's digital. I have them bookmark it. Um, and what I've done is just add a variety of sources that is broken down essentially by the type of categories of evidence that students need to be able to reference on the rubric <laughs> and in the question. They're also just good solid research things. So step one for research, go to the book. Step two, go to the constitution, make sure you have solid foundations. That's where like the background category is in that first column. Um, but the resource center crash course, I have a lot of kids who would much rather hear videos or podcasts, which I know is the next slide as well. Let's make sure we understand the constitutional principles, connections, and analysis. So that's the second step. 
then let's go back and see what the founders and framers or people in the time period said. Um, the founders constitution is probably my overall favorite website because if you click on it, it has excerpts, not the full text, excerpts on every single part of the constitution um, during ratification debates, during the drafting process. And so if your students are researching like the necessary and proper clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, or separation of powers, as Emily has pulled up here, they can find a variety of Federalist and Anti-Federalist sources, as well as like later theoretical understandings and judicial decisions on these issues. And the excerpt that's provided is only focus on that topic. So they don't have to wade through something that might be really long to get to it. My kids love it. Um, but I have a whole list of different things. Um, on the second page in that list, I have the Center for the Study of the American Constitution that um, a lot of the primary sources quoted in the questions from the center um, come from this. One of the people who leads that institution, Tim Moore, is amazing. He's a judge. He's a consultant. He does um, the Friends of Publius videos, which we're going to talk about in a minute. He's like a legend with my students. Yes. And yeah. then I have um, Supreme Court decision sources, um, recommendations for current events, just again, the ones that my students have found helpful. I have a whole slew of podcasts, public opinion. And then also I kept the like research databases access. I don't know if you have access to JSTOR at your institution, we do um, specifically for We the People. Um, and so we have that. The Congressional Research Service is free. There is no access code. I just didn't know where else to put it. Um, <laughs> it's through the Library of Congress. Also amazing. So I tell my students, look, like if you don't follow current events, pick one of these things in the current events column and start there, like read the headlines or do whatever. And so I this is usually my, you don't have to just use these sources, but when you're getting started and don't know where to look, these are a great launching pad. Um, thank you, Megan. And I will add on that interactive constitution from the National Constitution Center. So it not only provides common interpretation, it will provide you with multiple sides of interpretation. So if there is an issue, for example, the Second Amendment, for which there are multiple opinions on, on how to interpret that part of the Constitution, they will have little mini essays representing the different viewpoints. So given that you know the rubric is asking students to at least recognize that there are multiple perspectives, this is a great place to start. <laughs> All right, so we'll get back here. Okay, so we've already kind of started down the road of resources and tools, um, but of course, there's more. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, so I'll start here. Um, the good news um, is we're gonna give you, um, we call it the document we can never find in our files, but we know where it is now. Um, we officially call it online and beyond, um, and it is a treasure trove of online documents, but also books. Um, and you don't feel like you have to buy all of these books, um, but over the years of teaching this, you will find that you will just start accumulating some of them. And um, if you are an avid reader in the world of history and politics, a lot of these names um, should be familiar to you. Um, pretty much anything by Jack Rakov or Akhil Ritamar is going to be goldmine for We the People students. And they also, um, the center will often use um, quotations um, from things they have written or done um, throughout the uh, state hearing questions as they create them. And <clears throat> um, in addition to the, the list that Megan just shared, um, we're going to share a whole list of online sites that are just going to be super helpful. And what we did um, in the document that we're going to share with you is um, we gave you the online link and then we gave you like a two to three sentence, like this is what you can find there. And I'm pretty sure everything that we gave you is free. Um, the only um, exception is you might have to create an account and let them email you. So if you're like me, you have a, an old Hotmail account that you use for those kinds of things. Um, so if you don't want to get a weekly email, but you want access to something, just open an old Hotmail account. And that thing is that I can't even tell you how many emails are probably in that account right now. Um, but anyways, um, so 
build your library up with students, let them have access to it. Um, and my room is just got way too many bookshelves at school and all the books that I've accumulated over the years. But um, you can always use the online things as well that are going to be super helpful. Um, I'll just shout out the Avalon project as a big one. Um, that one is uh, has all of the like Federalist essays, for example, um, and a lot of the like famous uh, historical documents. And they're in the actual language. So it's still the primary source, but it's not a situation where you've got like all these ads and stuff like that that you have to contend with. And then um, the National Constitution Center, in addition to their um, interactive constitution, they have Constitution 101 um, that is new from, I think, last year. And if you've ever heard the name Linda Monk, um, which if you haven't, you need to look her up. Um, she's another great author resource person um, for all things We the People, but she helped create that series. Um, and it's a video series that I even use with my um, with my on grade level government students. It's super like engaging for students and it really like if your kids like for example my students have been working on that 14th amendment question with substantive due process there's a great video on substantive due process um in that constitution 101 series that explains it and also says the word um because kids don't know how to say that word either um so it helps them um you know learn a little bit more about it and like like Megan said, um, a lot of kids are more likely to watch and listen to a video than they are to read an article. So um, that's a great series um, for that too. And we have that linked on the big document as well. Do you want anything, Megan? Yeah, just about the books. Um, I know a lot of schools don't have budgets for like student yeah. libraries and teacher libraries. I get that. My school does not. Um, so I have accumulated piecemeal over the 16 years, a pretty vast library do not sleep on book resellers and half price books. I go into half price books frequently, specifically for my Read the People class. And every time I go, there's another copy of America's Constitution and Biography there. Um, I always see that. I always see something by Ray Cove. I always see um, stuff by Eric Foner. And usually Pauline Miller has like one or two, like either her Declaration of Independence book or Ratification. Um, but even in the list of others, like look at, they usually have it in the law section or in the constitutional history section. Um, you can find a lot of way more affordable books or even use books on like Amazon or something like that, um, where you can pick those up bit by bit. Yes, absolutely. That's a great idea. And um, if you happen to live in a, a college town, um, you know, often the university libraries will offer borrowing privileges to local community members. So, you know, worst case scenario, you can send the students just to borrow a book for a few weeks, long enough to work on their opening statement and then, you know, return it when they're done. <laughs> oh, yay, it's Megan and I's favorite. Um, okay, we're both going to talk about Friends of Publius because, well, they're everyone's best friend. Um, the tagline on this slide is just so superb. I can't even tell you. Um, so Friends of Publius is exactly what it says, um, but they have a great video series and they, they don't answer the hearing questions for your students, but they all get together online and they record themselves, as my students would say, a whole hour talking about all of the hearing questions and they've already dropped three um for this year's um new uh this year's uh, new set of questions and they're fascinating and the cool thing is if your students are struggling with understanding the question or if they're just like i said they don't answer the question but they talk about a lot of stuff that could totally be used as evidence and things that you want to bring up, you know, in follow-up questioning or, and at least two of them, I don't even know if all four of them, um, they've been judges before. So they know what they want to ask about the questions. So they're great. They're super entertaining. And like Megan said, um, these guys are like rock stars to my students. They think they're the coolest people on the face of the planet. Absolutely. They're up to six videos for this year. Oh, good. That's good news. They've been putting them out at a pretty, pretty solid clip. Um, one of the things I love is that they do timestamp their videos. And for students who might just need help on one particular part of the question, this is a great way for them to jump to that conversation to also make them feel a little less wary of using, as Ashley mentioned, a whole hour long video. 
Um, and so that they are godsends um, for really people, teachers, and students. Yes, agreed. Um, okay, so more perfect. Um, this is a fantastic um podcast for all things the Supreme Court. Um, just to give you a little teaser, um, if you know anything about Supreme Court history um, and all of the amazing um, progressive cases that were decided during the Warren Court, um, there's an interview. Um, one of the podcast episodes is an interview with Earl Warren, and they ask him what he, think the mo- what he thinks the most influential case that he presided over was. And I mean, of all the things he could pick, Brown, Gideon, Miranda, the man picks Baker v. Carr. It is fascinating. Um, so just um, it's it's a very it's a really good podcast. Um, and if you if you have um, again, it's free. You just have to um, download the episodes or whatever. Um, but yeah, I can't speak more highly of More Perfect. And they they were kind of out of the game for a little while, but they just dropped a whole bunch of new episodes probably within the last six months. So there's even some new content in there and they've gotten into some of the new um, court cases that have been on the docket the past like three to five years, um, which is uh, super fascinating. So this podcast is gonna be super helpful in particular to your unit five people, Um, but any of the units can use it, but it'll definitely be helpful to your unit five students. Civics 101 is broader in its scope as a podcast, but I like the kids like it because they're usually shorter um, and because they do a lot of funny bits. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, kids like funny bits to keep them engaged. But I do love that they go over like foundational questions as well. And um, so from a student perspective, this is a good, like, get the background, get the context of a subject. From a teacher standpoint, I love Civics 101 because they um, often provide, like, teacher-made lesson plans or even, like, note sheets. So if your students are struggling to pull out the main ideas, um, they make those available for free to teachers that could help. And then finally, Ashley and Emily already mentioned mm-hmm. uh, the National Constitution Center. I provided a link there. We have a link um, under that box that will take you to like a topics page where you can find written commentary, scholar exchanges, classroom sessions on that particular subject. Yes. So um One of the things that we'll share after this, which we have shared after sessions one and two, um, you all will get a view only version of the slide deck. So you can go through and click the links. Um, So nice perk. (laughs) Okay, so we have reached our asynchronous time. Um, So as we've done in the past, Ashley and Megan and I will um, will hang out in in our little space here, but um, you should feel free to, you know, go take a break um get lunch if you know. have a snack um and we'll we'll be also be happy to answer your questions during this point as well um so i will at least pause the recording and all right well welcome back from our asynchronous time thank you to those of you who hung out and, and asked some questions um we are certainly happy to answer questions afterwards as well um but i hope you had a, a good break so we will resume with uh tips and tricks for hosting in school competitions all right so as a quick reminder and this is a callback to our first session there are multiple avenues of competition you can choose from. So you can do your own in-school event, and this can be done anytime. Um, but if you are choosing to do a more you know, competitive approach, there will be regional or state competitions um, in every state organized by your state coordinator. And that leads up to national level competition. Um, For high school students, that's the We the People finals, Um, but we also have a national invitational competition, which is open to middle and high school students. And invitational is probably not the right word. It's more like national optional (laughs) Um, because it, it truly doesn't matter where you placed or ranked if you're a high school student in your state competition. If you want to can uh, continue your competition experience, you can. Um, And then for middle school students, not every state actually has an organized middle school competition. So you could in fact, just go straight to the invitational if you're a middle school teacher. 
Um, so we're going to dive in a little bit further, though, to the in-school option. Okay, so we have actually pulled together a bunch of different resources for you, but the sort of quick steps to go through, um, figure out which classes will be involved. If you're doing this for just a single class, also like that's totally fine. Um, if you teach multiple sections of US government and you, you know, want to involve two or three sections of your classes, that's great. If you want to make this every section of AP government at your high school or every section of US government, also great. Um, this can be done at truly any number of classes involved. Um, you'll obviously need to choose a date <laughs> uh, because that will help you make a lot of other decisions um, based on instructions that you're, you're going to give your students. So you'll choose your date and then choose what questions you want the students to use and you get them rolling on the preparation. So I want to highlight that you know, if you're doing this yourself, there is, unless you really want to, no reason for you to do all six units of questions. So if you would like to make this an event where you are exclusively focusing on uh, units five and six, units one and two, units three and four, that's completely fine. Um, you can choose the questions that are coming out of the Center for Civic Ed in their yearly new questions or um, at that exact same website that we had put up before for the hearing questions, you can also access about 10 years worth of previous questions at the state level, um, as well as previous national level questions. So you can take a look through those, um, see if there are ones that you think are particularly interesting or that your students might really get behind, um, and then make those your competition questions. Um, we had a, a chat during the lunch break about also taking into account how much time you have to offer to students to prepare for this event and how that might also influence the questions you choose. Um, so if you are, for example, organizing one of these and you're planning to do a little mini in-school competition in five or six weeks, that might dictate some of the questions you're choosing. So uh, one of the things we mentioned um, when we were looking at the questions earlier, some of the questions, the bold plus the bullets, were more narrow in focus. And some of them were extremely broad in focus. So if you have a limited amount of time for the students to prepare, you might wish to kind of handpick or cherry pick those questions with a narrower focus because that will allow the students a better opportunity for success um, in that short space of time. Emily, can I jump in for a quick second? Um, I, I, again, I teach high school, not middle school, but my middle school counterpart, um, they do this with um, our like uh, magnet kids. So they do it in sixth and seventh. And then in eighth grade, they do like an actual competitive experience. But in sixth and eighth grade, what they do for just their like in-class competition is they pick a singular question, meaning not a bold and two bullets. They just pick a bold or a bullet. And then they have them do um, in sixth and seventh grade, they just do that one singular question. So if you're starting out with this, or even it might even be helpful, like to work kids up to that. Um, but it's definitely you don't have to use the entirety even of a question. That's a great point. Yeah, 100%. And that's, you know, true at every level. So the middle school questions that are in the back of the teacher edition, if you just want to pick one element of that, or if you want to create original questions, that's also totally fine. All right, so once you've uh, covered that, you've got your dates set, um, you can decide who you want to be the judges for the day. So whether it's administrators, outside guests, um, anyone at all <laughs> that you would like to bring in. Um, I've, I have, I think, seen pretty much everybody, high school students that are graduates of an eighth grade program, college students that are graduates of a high school program, they can come back and be judges. Um, you know, inviting school board members is, is always a great way to go. 
potentially parents, although I would tend to say parents of your graduates over parents of your current students, if that's possible. Um, those are all good options. Um, we have created uh, a shared folder that we'll share with you after this. And there is a folder that is all sorts of resources specific to in-school hearings, including invitation language that you can just copy, edit what you need to, but it will at least explain to the person you're asking what it is that you're asking them to do. <laughs> um, you'll al also need to, of course, book the rooms you need for competition day. So if you're uh, endeavoring to do this during the course of a school day, um, if you need a certain number of classrooms to be blocked off and dedicated to the purpose, that is good to know if you're trying to use the library, um, trying to get a, a section of the library that's not going to be inundated every block with a new group of students coming in. Um, or if you are trying to do this on a weekend, um, which rooms you'll be able to have access to, <laughs> who's unlocking the door for you, that sort of thing. Um, any of these are, are totally feasible. I will say if you are planning to do this on a school day, one of the other useful uh, reminders is uh, to at least have little signs ready to let the students know who are trying to come into that classroom. No, no, this class has been moved to this other location temporarily because of this event going on today, because it doesn't matter how many times you say it, someone will miss the memo. <laughs> um, so signage is, is good to have uh, reminders at the ready. I always forget to do this. And so finally, God bless our school resource center. They're like, you are always running down to make these signs. So they printed one out and laminated it for me. So I wouldn't forget. And then I can just like Velcro it to the front of my door. Um, so Emily's advice, it's lifesaver. Otherwise you're going to have kids walking in and out constantly. Lock the door too, because so many look right at the sign and just open said door. Oh, gosh. Uh, all right. And last but not least, um, you'll need to train your volunteers. Um, so if you if you are in a position to do this just the morning of the event, that is totally sufficient. Don't feel like you need to do a whole thing in the days before. No, not that big of a deal. Um, just have your volunteers come in early on the day that you're planning to do this. Um, you know, if you can give them donuts <laughs> and then, you know, walk through the rubric. Um, possibly show a video of a hearing and explain, this is what you're going to do. This is what I need you to fill out. And then here's your schedule for today. Uh, but that those resources are also in the folder, um, including a page that is instructions for judges, which you can certainly distribute ahead of time. Um, and that it includes all the other instructions about whoever is holding the stopwatch for the hearing in progress. Um, and it also includes a time and one minute sign if you want to print that out too. So we tried to put as much as we could in there to, to get you off on the right foot. Okay, so actually organizing your day depends very heavily on a bunch of different factors. First among them is how many classes or groups you have participating at once. Um, and then how many judges or volunteers you have been able to recruit and how much time you have available. <laughs> so um, I put this one up on the screen just as an example. So what I would suggest, if possible, if you are asking your groups of judges to move from room to room, that you try to provide 20 minutes for a hearing. So in the space of 20 minutes, that should allow your judges time to get to the right room get seated, give their introductions, ask the students to give their introductions. We have 10 minutes for the hearing experience. We have a few minutes for feedback. And then in the last couple of minutes, uh, the, the judges will then depart the room. Somewhere in the hallway, they'll jot down comments on the rubric, and then they can go to the next location. This works significantly better if the students are set in one classroom. So it is way easier to move judges than it is to move kids. So when I uh, have this up on the screen, 
what I mean by this is the unit one judges will stop in room 100 first, do their hearing. Then the unit one judges will get up and leave. Then they'll go to room 200, do their thing, get up and leave room 300, et cetera. So that is considerably easier than attempting to move kids, which is nuts. <laughs> so um, in each of those rooms, 102 in this imagined scenario, um, you would have the students who are presenting at any given time, and then everybody else in that class would just be seated in the class just watching. Um, you might assign one of them to be the timekeeper for the other panels who are presenting. Um, you don't necessarily need to bring in an adult just to hold a stopwatch. The students can definitely do that. <laughs> so this is what this particular scenario looks like. If you cannot swing 20 minutes and you have to make it shorter, you can do it. Just I would suggest make sure the rooms are close together. If the rooms are on opposite sides of the school building, it's going to take you some time. So, you know, give, give your judges a reasonable amount of travel time if you can. You can extend it more than 20 minutes if you want to. It's generally not needed, but I, I will leave that to you to know your building and, and know the scenario. All right, so in this other one, um, so in this one, you would have just a single class of students in a single room. And so in this case, the panelists would be answering unit one, question one during the first hearing, unit two, question one in the second hearing, et cetera, et cetera. And if this is the case, you do not need to recruit all that many judges. Um, you could just recruit six if you wanted to, three of them to ask questions pertaining to unit one, three judges asking the questions for unit two that is a totally feasible thing to do. Um, I will also say this is a model that you can use if you are doing practice sessions that also involve outside guest judges. So for example, I have been called in with like two other people and we just hear everybody one after the other. You know, we have the questions in front of us, um, but you know, we just stay there and then the students take turns presenting and then we uh, for practice we'll just give verbal comments to say okay that this part sounded really good this part I think you could probably tie up a little bit I would have liked to hear more evidence about this that kind of thing um, so this is one that you can do as well um, so Ashley has some questions in the chat or not questions comments in the chat so Ashley Go ahead and give us your examples for the benefit of the recording. Sure. Um, so the last um, the last slide that Emily was on, um, she said, like, you, you don't need definitely give them 20. Um, I'll let you know that <clears throat> I always do 30 when I'm using um, a bunch of outside judges. Um, when I'm doing multiple groups like this, I always do 30 because the one other reason for doing 30 minutes a piece is not only does it allow for travel time, but if you have judges that have never done this before and they're judging multiple teams, sometimes they like to quick convene about what they just saw before they see the next one. And 30 is always enough time. And then also um, this happens um, sometimes in, in even in the competitions that we're not planning. Some of the judges um, are long winded in their feedback, which is great. We love to hear feedback, but if you do 30 minutes a unit, it allots for that um, extra time. And then the second example um, Emily used is the one that I've been using for the last couple of years. And um, I've used this model before with as little as 10 judges and it works out. Um, it, it's just really helpful that you have an odd number of judges on every panel. Um, so you don't want just one person, you don't want two. Um, so it's good to have at least three. And then I just ask um, of my judges, well, I don't really ask if they're my We The People alums, they do more than one unit. That's pretty much how it works. And then the adults just do one each. Um, but um, that, will, um, that will work very well. And Emily's comment earlier about if you're going to use parents, um, only use previous alums' parents. The only time I break that rule is if I have a parent who is like, actually like this year I have a parent who's in secret service and I have a parent like very government oriented parents and they're going to judge but they're just not going to judge their child's unit so as long as they're not as long as they actually have a 
little bit of background in this topic and they're not judging their kids unit, um, that can work out too. But I'll let you know how that goes because I have never actually done it before, but I have two this year. So we'll see how it goes. I do it every year. Um, we, I happen to teach in an area that has um, a pretty decent amount of the population with like post-secondary like master's degrees or professional degrees. And so every year I have parents who are either in our local government or have some state government experience who are judges, who are attorneys. Um, and it works great. Like the big thing is I put them outside of their children's room, as Ashley mentioned, less because I think they're going to like be too nice to their kids. But sometimes I found that the parents are the harshest judge of their own students. And, you know, we don't need that extra stress. And also the students are mortified sometimes. So like, oh God, please do not let my mother judge me, you know, or something like that. So it's just a way to make everyone more comfortable. But if you have access to that, like I pull from judges every which way. That is a, that's a great point. And that leads beautifully into our next slide. Who should you invite to judge? Okay, so we mentioned before there are some options and we have parents, if applicable, listed here on the list. Um, so every state does have a state coordinator. And uh, as we mentioned in session one, if you don't know who your state coordinator is, please get in touch. Um, we have a, a map on civiced.org where you can find your state coordinator. Um, your state coordinator would love to come help you and um, work with you in the, in the classroom setting. Uh, people in your central office staff are really good for this. School board, local government is great. Local college professors, if that applies. Local service organizations. Um, let me tell you, the Rotarians love this program. <laughs> Um, booster club members, and then, you know, alumni who might happen to be in your area also. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're generally very, very, very happy to, to help you out. One other thing about alumni is that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be alumni to your specific program. Usually your state coordinators know of alumni in your state or at least in a neighboring state. Like, for example, a lot of We The People kids end up working for the government. So like, for example, I have someone that comes and judges uh, my students and she's an alum of the We The People program in California. But since she works for the British embassy in DC now, we're on the same time zone and it's very easy for her to virtually come in and assist students. So um, there is a whole We The People alumni network that your state coordinators have access to through the center. Um, so if you're brand new to this program, don't be like, well, I don't have any alumni, so that won't work. There are plenty, thousands of We The People alumni out there that can very easily, um, because they want to volunteer, even if they can just pop in virtually to assist during practice sessions that will really um, come out and help. Yes. They would love, love, love to help you. <laughs> yeah, no question about that. Um, so when it comes to what information you should provide to your volunteers and judges, uh, the best thing to do would be in advance to provide them with the question that the students are responding to. And a couple weeks notice is fine. I mean, they don't need to be working on a statement of their own, um, but some advance notice is good so that they can at least anticipate some of what the students are going to be discussing. You can also then provide them with the judge instruction sheet, which is in the shared folder. There's also in there a separate slide deck for judge training, which you can just page right on through. And that's something that you can do the day that you actually have your in-school competition, um, but you can certainly check it out ahead of time. And I do wanna point out that um, you don't need to feel like you need to recruit subject matter experts. You Attorneys are lovely, but you don't have to have an attorney. It, I mean, anyone from the local business community is totally fine. Whoever it is just needs to be willing to do a little bit of background reading. And so one thing that uh, Megan does, and Ashley might do this as well, is provide the judges with a PDF scan of uh, just like the lessons of the textbook that are relevant to that question which is super helpful because that at least provides for the judge the base information that they know the students also had access to. So 
that's a that's a great starting point. And then the extent to which your volunteer chooses to read above and beyond that, great. <laughs> so um, that this is what we, we mean by providing them a little bit of time to do a little bit of background, but you know, don't worry about them being a subject matter expert. And Megan points out that yes, if you have a chamber of commerce in your region, they can definitely be helpful to bring in local community leaders and business owners. We do love them too. <laughs> All right, and then on hearing day, you can show your judges a video of what the hearing process looks like. That's very helpful. You'll review the schedule. Here's what we're gonna do today. Here are the rooms that you're going to. If it's gonna be super complicated for some reason, consider providing a student guide <laughs> to bring the groups of judges from room to room to room. Um, that's very handy. And then you'll review the, the exact process. You know, So judges, you'll introduce yourselves. You'll ask the students to introduce yourselves. Uh, one of the judges will serve as the lead and they'll read the question. Then the students will respond, et cetera. So you, you just walk them through what's gonna happen. And then you'll review the judge's role. One of the things that is in the training slide deck are what we consider fair and foul questions. So, you know, be, many of the questions that we have provided in the, in the previous year, you'll have uh, potentially access to suggested follow-up questions on some of those. So even if the judges don't have suggested follow-up questions in front of them, they will need to be able to ask the students questions. Um, so the training slide deck does go into more detail about the first point of questions should come from the student's opening statement. From there, <laughs> then you can ask questions that you know for a fact were in the student textbook. That's completely fine. You can ask questions that are sort of common knowledge questions. You can ask questions that are open-ended opinion-based questions. All of that's fine. Um, but it also then points out questions that are not fair questions. Um, so questions that are not related to anything that the students have read, um, number one. Um, you should encourage judges not to ask questions that take two and a half minutes to ask because it's impossible to follow a question that takes that long to ask. <laughs> um, and then, you know, not to ask questions that are so detailed that only someone with a graduate degree would be able to respond. Um, so anyway, the training slide deck does go into greater detail with that. And Megan has a note like in our notes for this, but um, make sure you practice the introductions um, with your students, because if you don't tell them they have to introduce themselves, they will get asked to introduce themselves and have no idea what to say. So um, for example, for my students, we practice saying our name, if what their year is in school. So like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then I have them share um, their future plans, like what they wanna do. Um, but uh, I've seen some, I've seen some teams where they use like their favorite Federalist essay quote or just like something to kind of like that they're prepared to say that will kind of break the ice a little bit with the judges because if they get like a little chuckle or a smile, they might not see that the rest of the hearing. So it makes them a little comfortable and getting in the in the groove. Yeah. Um, even when you do practice it, it's amazing how they'll get up in front of judges and be like, good morning. My name is uh, <laughs> and you see like terror on their face. A few years ago, I had. Um, a class and a team that just decided they were going to type hello um, and find as many synonyms as they can. So, you know, it was like greetings, salutations. Um, students whose primary language or first language may not be English were greeting people in um, the their primary language or at least saying hello in it. And so if nothing else, it gives the students a bit of excitement and you can see their like shoulders relax a bit and they breathe more. So it's a good like calming technique too. That's I'm not a kidding thing. when we say the breathing thing, like encourage them to breathe. Like you have to remind them to do that. So <laughs> yeah, breathing is really good. Um, and another thing I'll, I'll add on to this as well is review anything else that the judges 
or volunteers might need to know. So at 1015, there will be a bell, a loud and obnoxious, annoying bell that no one will be able to talk over. So when that happens, everybody just pause for the five seconds and move on. So let the judges know about that. Um, or if there are any special circumstances that your students are working with. So it doesn't change the judges final you know reaction or their final scoring to be told that you know hey in unit two for this particular panel one of the students has a, a really severe stutter so the other panelists have you know worked out a way that if this particular student gets stuck this is what they're going to do but just so you know this is a thing or um let's see there's another one where one of the students needed to use a microphone. So, okay, fine, no worries. Anything that just might strike the judges as unusual is just good to give them a heads up. Yeah, I had a student this past year who um, used a, like an adaptive hearing device where they wore um, a hearing aid, but also had, it looked like a USB um, stick, honestly, but it was just a small device that they would set at the edge of the table to amplify what other people were saying through their hearing aid. And at every level of competition, I would just tell the moderator before that particular set of judges came in, like, if you could let them know that this isn't an attempt to cheat or anything, um, this is just simply an adaptive device that this student needs. And everyone was wonderful about it. And in one situation at nationals, the judges even scooched the tables closer together to make sure that that student could see their um, lips as they spoke um, because they were able to mouth read as well. So super helpful. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So then you've finished whatever your in-school hearing is, whether it's in one class, whether it's three or four classes. First thing, congratulate the participating students. <laughs> Um, once they get through their hearing, it's amazing. They're like, oh, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought. Okay. <laughs> and they're usually, you know, pretty, pretty relieved and also really proud of themselves that they were able to answer some really challenging questions and have those conversations with, um, with the judges. So by all means, congratulate your students. Um, then you can go about debriefing the activity, whether that's something you do right away or something you do just the next time you see them, however your schedule is built. Um, you can ask students, you know, you can debrief the activity just as a class discussion, or uh, you can also ask students to reflect on their experiences in writing. Uh, a lot of teachers will choose to do this as just a, a reflection on the experience as a whole. So how did they find working as a group? How did they find interacting with the judges? Um, it, it just allows the students a moment to, to kind of look back on on everything that they've done. If you want to, you can uh, also collect the judges score sheets. So I say if you want to, because if you're doing this as an in-class exercise that's just for practice purposes, or you want the students to experience the simulated hearing without any scoring attached to it, that is 100% fine. Um, in the Center for, Educa Center for Civic Education, we would call that a showcase. So there's no scoring attached. It's just the experience. That's fine. If, however, you do want the judges to provide scores, that is also fine. Um, we would encourage you, if you're doing that, not to make the judges final score the student's grade. You can take that into consideration along with other factors um, to issue a final or project grade, that's fine. But please don't make just the judges scores the final grade. Um, so Ashley and Megan, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, like how you would use judge scoring or feedback for your students. Sure. I'm going to use it. Well, I use it in a, several different ways. I have a standalone dedicated We the People class that's focused on the competition aspect but all of my students, all the students in my school in like an on-level gen ed U.S. government course use the We the People curriculum and use hearings as part of a final assessment grade for each unit. Um, and so 
I use judges scores as feedback to them on how to grow in the next time. But, but as those hearings are taking place, if I'm not serving on the panel, I'm in the audience scoring it myself with more careful attention to like, what do I know? Like, you know, sometimes what seems like a student stumble to outside judges is a massive accomplishment for a student that you know has struggled so much and they were able to talk once and it was awesome and they normally cry or hide when they have to speak that is are all those like um qualitative things that go into it as well so i let them see the judges feedback but then i score them from the grade perspective because i know the whole student rather than just that 10 minute snippet um for the competition class i like to get the judges feedback particularly moving from like regionals to state because it shows us how those units could grow and then from state to nationals in terms of national competition i love it because the students always have questions after the fact but then it's a good indicator for me as an instructor the next year like if i see we're constantly being dinged in that application part of the rubric I need to more heavily emphasize my instruction and embed that in more clearly and show students what that step looks like. So that is that is how I use um, judges feedback. Um, and I pair the judges feedback with the video recordings. Um, so I have someone that video records all of the levels. Um, and like Megan, um, my competition team is a separate class on its own focused on the competition. And so I have somebody record all of the hearings. So I give them all the judges score sheets. Um, and then essentially before I give them the judges score sheets, I have them watch the video back and use the score sheets to judge themselves and then use it as a comparison. And then I've also had them judge each other. Um, <clears throat> and that way I don't have them do it like in the midst of the competition, but I have them do it with the videos afterwards. And usually um, I do, yes, to answer Alex's question in the chat, absolutely share the rubric with students. Um, and it's even more, I almost just said more better. It's even more awesome this year because the center created a student version of the rubric, which you can find on that page. And you can give that to your students. And it's not just the rubric, but it basically says, as a student, this is what you should do in this section of the rubric to earn the most points. So absolutely share the rubric with them. Um, and then, um, uh, oh, train the train derailed. I was going to say something about something important, no doubt. Mm. I am currently, oh, sorry, go ahead. Ashley. Go, no, you go. It's gone. Okay, I am currently modifying the student version of the rubric for my students um, to be a peer review tool as well, and also a self-reflection tool. So I haven't done it yet, but what I'm intending to do eventually this school year is use it where when they submit like an opening statement or they submit like their potential responses to follow-up questions to me for review, like for the opening statement component, I want to have them not just check it off, but say where I see that element, like where do I see specific evidence being applied and then list that evidence. If nothing else, when they start writing it down, they'll start to see, okay, maybe we weren't as specific as we need it to be. Um, and so it's a great self-reflection and peer editing tool. Um, Thank you. So yeah, while we were chatting, uh, I just brought up the simulated congressional hearing scoring guide for students. So at the, the top, it explains the what is it that we're asking you to do in general? So what is this whole simulated congressional hearing about? Uh, and then for each category, there will be a description that is basically the, just in the form of instructions for students. So you and your classmates will write and deliver a well-organized and clear speech based on the questions from your unit. As a team, everyone should take part in the writing process as well as delivering the speech, use accurate information from the constitution, history, and other trusted source sources to strengthen your speech. And then on the right side column, this is the criteria as it appears in the rubric given to judges. So the students see an explanation for them they see what the judges see, and so they can use that to inform their final product. <laughs> or not, but <laughs> that's the ideal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can you can scroll down and, and see that. So it, it lays out the expectations pretty well. Okay, so great. So after the... Um, 
we, you, you can do your own assessment as the, um, as Ashley and Megan were saying, and then another self-reflection option um, can be included in that mix as well. All right, so lastly, we wanted to talk about building our community of practice as we the people educators. So yes, this is um, virtual, but we would still like to be able to support all of you as you continue down your We the People adventure. And so we uh, do have a library of useful material, and we'll share that with you by email, but um, you'll also get the slide deck that you can click on these links as well. Um, so the boot camp library is divided into the three sessions that we have met for. Um, today's session has a section entirely dedicated to the in-school competitions. So this is where you would find your instructions for timekeeping, your sample outreach email, um, your sample hearing schedule, um, all of that you'll be able to access whenever you need it. And then for the other sessions, there's additional resources available to you as well, including the uh, amazing library of resources that Ashley and Megan put together. Okay, and we also wanted to be able to touch base with you for other reasons. So we will certainly have the boot camp video from today emailed out to you. All of the videos are on the Center for Civic Ed's YouTube page, so you can review them whenever you want. Um, if you are not already, please make sure that you are on the Center's newsletter mailing list. This is not the only professional development we do. We do a lot. <laughs> Sometimes we do uh, events with other partner organizations. Um, otherwise, we do sometimes have sessions dedicated to We the People, also Project Citizen, and we just want to make sure you're aware of all of those. Yes, and Ashley says, do not send that to the junk hotmail. No, you want this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, and then we talked about the resource library a little bit. Um, civiced.org also has some additional resources that are not just exclusive to We the People, but just in general, we have resources on our website, um, which are being improved all the time. Um, and then Ashley and Megan and I talked about in future months, we will do office hours. So we'll email the list of everybody who registered for these events, and we'll let you know when that is going to happen. So if the, basically, in, the intent is the three of us will hang out. If you have a question or a concern as you are moving through your We the People experience and you just want to chat it through with us, we will be there. Uh, so you can come chat with us and let us know how it's going or how we can help. Uh, but we will make that calendar aware to you uh, afterwards. Okay, so um, we will send you a certificate as well for the number of hours you joined us over the course of three sessions. So whether you know it's just today, whether it was the entire three, three sessions, uh, you'll get a certificate specific to you. And uh, with that, we will open up the floor to any outstanding questions that you may still have. And I will at this point go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>